we start this and today we have um, a nice presentations from two of our members. It's uh, Jenny will speak about the outcome of the Arctic Science Ministerial Meeting and Rolf Rödwin will speak about the outcome of the Arctic Council Meeting. Two important meetings that have been held over the last two months. So I think that they have 15 minutes for presentation and then we have questions. So maybe if we start with Rolf and when Rolf finished, we can take questions to him and then we take Jenny afterwards. So Rolf, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lars Otto. And uh, I guess I could say uh, good morning to most of you and good afternoon to, to some of us, uh, depending on time so on. So please, uh, let me just share my, share my screen. So I hope you can, can see See my presentation. Uh, if you could, please could just give an indication if you can see it or not. That's uh, good. And and please, if if my if the slides freezes or something, please just tell because I want to see um, how it looks like from your side. Um, oh, sorry. I guess I started with the last slide here. So that's, <laughs> that's okay. It's uh, <laughs> always good to. It's always good to to. <laughs> start with and isn't it uh, do it over again here we go i guess this this looks better i hope it looks more like the beginning though the same it's the same picture so thanks a lot for the opportunity to to uh, talk about uh, AMAP and AMAP's deliverables to the ministerial meeting and the ministerial meeting itself. Um, as Schlotos mentioned, I am, my name is Rolf Röden. I'm the uh, executive secretary of AMAP. Uh, I guess in this four, I could say I'm the new Lars Otto or the younger Lars Otto. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, and hopefully you'll be here to, to support me. So um, I'll, I'll say something about um, the deliverables we had for the ministerial meeting now. Um, and also a bit about the future plans. Uh, but I guess first, I, I just would like to take the opportunity to to uh, remind ourselves about uh, here we go uh, about AMAP. Um, also to um, to remind ourselves about that uh, a bit more than a week ago we had a 30th anniversary. So AMAP was established June 14th, 1991. Um, as part of the Arctic uh, Environmental Protection Strategy and has been a working group to the Arctic Council since its Arctic Council's establishment in 96. And um, just as the other working groups and the Arctic Council, we do have delegates from the eight Arctic states, the six permanent participants, uh, that is the indigenous peoples organizations, um, observers from, from non-Arctic states, from governmental organizations and non-governmental organizations. And, of course, uh, most importantly, we do have a large pool of, of experts. We have experts groups, seven expert groups consisting of about, I guess now about 700, 750 experts that is actually doing the, doing the work. So I'm, I'm having the pleasure of just coordinating it and see the, see the excellent outcomes from the, from the experts. And since, since uh, 2018, the Secretariat of AMAP has been located in Tromsø, uh, Norway at the Fram Center. So we, we are located together with the Norwegian Polar Institute and, uh, and Norwegian Institute of Nature Research and so on. So in total, 21 institutions at the Fram Center. The 20th of May this year, the Arctic Ministerial uh, meeting took place in Reykjavik, Iceland. Uh, and to this meeting, AMAP delivered uh, in total seven products. Uh, those you can see on the on your screen now. So, and they range and they range from if start from the uh, top left, the uh, Arctic climate change update. Uh, we do have one on on uh, shortly climate forces, pops and chemicals that is persistent organic pollutants and chemicals of emerging Arctic concern, uh, mercury, and human health. Um, in addition, we also have the last couple of years we've been working with digital microplastics. We did we did uh, present the monitoring plan as well as 
an overview of the initiatives we do have on plastic pollution in the Arctic. The five first one, the five first summary policy makes, as you can see here on the screen, um, they are um, based upon um, scientific assessments or technical reports um, of about 200 pages each, fully, fully referenced and peer reviewed. Uh, all these reports are now in, their, uh, in the final phase of production. So, so you will see them um, launched on our, our website, uh, amap.no in late summer, early fall this year. Uh, though, though the uh, summary polls make a range over, over a var variety of topics, they do have something in common. And I guess that is something we will see also in the future for AMAP. So both the, I mean, of course, the climate uh, update and the, the climate forces uh, focus on climate, but also the report on pops and chemicals about the concern and mercury and partly also human health focuses on how climate change actually, actually affects uh, processes and pathways uh, of um, the, the uh, distribution or transport distribution, uptake and accumulation of pollut pollutants in the Arctic. So what we do see now is uh, climate change being such an important driver for all processes in the Arctic that we, we, we would like to, to assess climate change also for um, those um, assessments Mainly, based, mainly focused on, on contaminants. We can speak a bit more about them later. Today, I'm mainly going to focus on, on this one, uh, the Arctic Climate Change Update, um, and, and uh, some of the key findings in, in, um, that is referred to in, in, in that document. Uh, however, also, we can also discuss the other assessments if you, if you would like to. Um, a bit historical um, data first, as you, as you all remember, uh, the SWEPA report on snow water, ice and permafrost in the Arctic report from 2017, 2017 was the uh, latest large assessment report we did on climate. Um, then in 2019, we did a, um, an update, a 16 page update on the SWEPA report, uh, updating trends and, and, uh, and levels of, of uh, different indicators of climate change. This year we have done uh, partly the same. So, so a lot of the uh, contents in this report is um, organized the way as the sweeper report was. But as I said, this is based upon a separate technical report or a separate uh, assessment, uh, uh, fully re referenced uh, scientific assessment. Um, and I also would say, in addition to, to the sweeper report, this one also have one chapter on impacts on, on ecosystem ecosystems as well as society, one chapter on societal impacts. So we have kind of expanded the scope of climate change, uh, also focusing more on, on impacts, both for, for the ecosystems as well as for the people living in the Arctic. The, when we presented the, the, um, uh, the report to the ministerial meeting, of course, the most striking uh, result is the accelerating increase of Arctic warming. Um, in, the report, in the report, we, we do say that uh, when we analyze data from uh, 1971 to 2019 on, on average annual surface temperature, um, we have for a long time been talking about that the Arctic is warming twice as fast as uh, the global average. However, recent data show that we are now actually uh, three times have a three times higher rate than, than the global average. So, so the results we reported this year are higher than we reported in previous AMAP assessments. This figure here shows the um, shows uh, surface temperature data uh, as well as interpol model interpolation of the Arctic Ocean, uh, showing the trend from 1971 to 2019. So, and, and throughout this 49 year period, you can see uh, general increase. However, you can, as you can see of the uh, coloration, the, 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 uh, the most intense warming is taking place uh, north of, of Nova Semblan and so in the um, Russian part of the Arctic. Mm. 
one follow up from the sweep uh, report that we would that we did take on in this period was the um, connections between the arctic climate uh, or arctic weather patterns and the the um, mid latitude weather patterns we have been reporting earlier some uh, some examples of, of connections between mid latitude and arctic arctic uh, weather however uh, in this report when we've been looking uh, more through it more throughout, uh, we do see that the, the linkages are complex and, and inconsistent. So, so the con conservative uh, approach to this is that, um, that there, are, there are linkages, but we, st we still do not fully understand them. And we do not st uh, have like the, we're not able to conclude, uh, fully conclude in this report. However, this is something that we will revisit in, in the upcoming, upcoming reports. We do have uh, old projections also in, in, in this report and, and the newest generation of coupled global climate model projections show that the annual mean surface uh, air temperature in the Arctic will rise uh, from 3.3 .3 to 10 degrees Celsius uh, above the, the 1985 to 2014 average by the end of the century. Of course, this depends on the future emissions. This kind of it co confirms the model predictions in the um, done in the sweep report, but it's also related to sweep report, but it also emphasizes the the uh, um, the, the, the extent of the warming. And as well, under most emission scenarios, uh, it confirms the the sweep, uh, um, saying that the the vast majority of the CMIP six models uh, project the first instance of of an ice free or sea ice free Arctic in September taking place before 2015. And that the probability of an ice free Arctic summer is 10 times greater under two, uh, two degree global warming scenario compared to 1.5 degree global warming scenario. So those, so the, the 0.5 degree difference is actually, a, has a great impact on, on the risk of, of an ice free summer happening. The physical drivers of Arctic change, they continue to change rapidly. And uh, one of the most pronounced ones is, of course, the land ice uh, mass balance. Um, <clears throat> we now see all the regions of the Arctic experience net loss of, of land ice. Uh, and, uh, and the rate has been decrease, uh, increasing uh, in the recent decades for several regions. Uh, and the most dramatic increase we see is, of course, Greenland. As you can see on this graph, showing the mass uh, community mass balance in gigatons from 71 to, to 2019. You can see Greenland as the green, Greenland as the green line uh, with a dr rather dramatic drop in, in mass balance. But you can also see the red and the black line representing Art, uh, uh, Alaska and Arctic Canada showing a, a quite uh, accelerating decrease in, in mass balance there. So Greenland is the, is the largest regional source accounting for 51% of the Arctic total. Uh, and as you all know, the, the uh, land ice loss in the Arctic is a major contribu uh, contributor to, to uh, global sea level rise. <clears throat> we, since, since the sweeper report, we have been focusing uh, to a large degree on, on extreme events, because also because um, we see that while average this is good scientific description, extreme events is often what is um, both perceived by the public, but also have so, sometimes have the strongest impact on, on the societies. Uh, but we do see a strong evidence of, of uh, the frequency of extreme events um, increasing. So, so both um, that warm extremes are increasing, but also that cold uh, extremes are decreasing in the Arctic. And for us, for those of us uh, that grew up in the Arctic uh, and have been used to, to uh, periods in winter with 30 degrees minus, uh, 30 degrees Celsius minus for, for long periods, they have more or less disappeared. So cold spell, spells lasting more than 15 days has almost completely disappeared from the Arctic since 2000. One other remote, uh, important um, extreme event is of course the uh, coastal erosion. And, and we see it accelerating in many parts of the Arctic. Um, and Arctic has some of the highest rates on earth. And what you see in, in Alaska, and we know this, uh, 
more heart than I do, but uh, we see as much as five meters coastline uh, disappearing annually in some parts of Alaska. This, of course, have impacts on infrastructure. So one of the chapters in the, in the report uh, focuses on, on infrastructure. So, so um, we do see uh, building slows and, and other infrastructures uh, suffering damage uh, from towing of ice rich permafrost in many regions of the Arctic. Uh, however, some of this, um, some of this uh, infrastructure suffering may be related to, to design rather than um, rather than climate change, uh, we're not able to disentangle that. Uh, so, so that's a kind of conservative <laughs> statement of us. But one study estimated that more than 36,000 buildings, 13,000 uh, 13, kilometers of roads, and more than 100 airports in Arctic could be at risk of damage from near surface uh, permafrost thaw by 2050. Uh, although, of course, the actual risk uh, at the individual sites is very much dependent on the local conditions. But we do know that several of the areas, in, in particular in, in, in the, the American Arctic and the, and the Russian Arctic, are, we do see infrastructure on, on permafrost. Uh, and we do reckon uh, infrastructure being that will be heavily influenced by permafrost for in the future. Both in the climate update, but also in short the climate forces report, uh, we do have uh, chapters describing wildfires. Um, in the short climate forces report, uh, also uh, focusing on, on emissions of, of wildfires, uh, of black carbon and methane. Um, <clears throat> we do see frequency of extreme wildfires increasing in parts of, of, of the Arctic, but not all of them. So, so in Alaska, it's, it has been increasing since 1915, and uh, in Siberia, it's, it shows an increase between 1996 and 2015. Uh, trends elsewhere is less clear, um, and in particular, Fenerskandia, this is probably due to uh, the importance of forestry and, and uh, wildfire suppress suppression. Um, the graph on the lower part here shows the total acres burned each year in Alaska. Um, and the, the orange uh, columns are occasions when we have more than 1 million acres burned a year. So as you can see on the graph, there's a rather, there's an increase both in the frequency, but also in the kind of magnitude or amplitude of, of wildfire. So, so the, it's, it's rather dramatic increase for those uh, that are, are, are either living, either have their, um, Society is affected directly or by having their income indirectly affected by, for instance, uh, when it comes to, to hunting or, 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 or such. So, uh, coming back to, to the ministerial meeting itself, uh, do our reports have any, do they have any impact? Do they have any impact in, in general? Uh, some of you may remember the ministerial meeting in 2019 in, in Rovaniemi, uh, which was highly referred to in media, but none of it, of it due to the deliverances of the, of the working groups. Um, at that meeting, Arctic warming was not mentioned at all. Uh, in the, there was no declaration, and, and, and due to the political situation, um, Arctic warming was not uh, brought up on the on, on the ministerial agenda as such. It was in the chairman's statement, but not in, in a consensus uh, statement by the, by the Arctic uh, ministers. However, in the Reykjavik declaration, we see something completely different. Um, I've allowed myself to, to, to uh, cut or to show you some, some parts of the declarations here. Uh, so uh, throughout the declaration, environmental uh, impacts are, are, are uh, emphasized, and in particular, impacts of climate change. So both on the first page, uh, you can see the ministers stressing the importance of achieving the Paris Agreement goals, and they call upon uh, all parties, uh, including Arctic states, and also here's worth mentioning the Arctic observer states. Some of them are major, country, uh, major emitters of, of greenhouse gases to implement and enhance the uh, their, their measures to in line with, agree, with the Paris Agreement. 
but also a bit later in the in the statement in the declaration they they describe in more detail uh, the utmost concern they have for the Arctic warming, how it affects ecosystems, um, as well as the the, the um, uh, societies, and recognize the the um, uh, effect of emissions of, of greenhouse gases, including short-lived climate forces, and and also reiterate the need for action. So, so in total, I guess we could say that, and, and I've been reading through. The declarations from the previous ministerial meeting, meetings before the the, the, the one in in, in uh, Romania as well. And in, in my opinion, we, uh, the ministerial declarations have never been so uh, outspoken on climate change, um, the the effects it's had on the Arctic, and the need for fraction. So I would say that it it did uh, it does make an impact. The work we do. However, it doesn't stop at the ministerial meeting. So I just, I just want to say some words about uh, the upcoming climate work from AMAP side. Uh, one of the things we have identified as a kind of a knowledge gap in, the, in the, both the sweep assessment and also what we do now is the, um, the relations between the climate change, the ecosystems and, and the impacts and feedbacks. So, so what we are, Starting up now is a large um, assessment, a joint assessment together with CAF on on how um, Arctic uh, how how Arctic warming is impacting the ecological states. Again, the which uh, results in ecological perturbations and how these feedbacks into to climate it can either be positive feedbacks or, or negative feedbacks. Another important thing we are implementing in this this assessment is also. And of course, again, uh, we're looking into how it affects societies. Uh, but a new thing that we're implementing is adaptation strategies and how, how we actually, through adaptations, can be able to restore, protect, or mitigate effects of protect uh, existence or mitigate effects of, of uh, climate change by, by conducting the right kind of management. So <clears throat> the, the blue parts of this diagram shows where AMAP has, has this, the, the the main responsibility of the green, green part is the AMAP CAF, and we also have some uh, joint work together with SDWG on, on more um, when it comes to disease, climate change and disease outbreaks like zoonosis. Yeah. So I guess that ends my presentation. So now is the slide you saw the first. So I can say thank you again. So, so thanks. Thank you very much, Rolf. It's uh, great to see the progress made and that the, uh, the ministers are back on track again to focus on climate and pollution in the ministerial declaration. That's good to see. We have a, um, open for questions, uh, so um, it's open for you to, uh, to take the floor and ask Rolf uh, what you would like. Uh, there I see Mike, you have a finger. Yes, Mike. Um, I actually have two questions. One is sort of one of process and one is more, more scientific. So on process, could you say something about how these assessments are, are funded and undertaken? Is it like the IPCC where it's all voluntary or are there Arctic institutes that sort of have responsibility for doing this? So, so that's sort of one question. And the, the second question is really whether given how much change is occurring in the Arctic, there's any discussion at all of trying to think about climate intervention in some sense, at, le at least researching the issue. I mean, it has, there are studies that show you can actually have a, at least some differential effect in the Arctic, um, possibly, but much more research. <laughs> so, thanks. Yeah. Thank you for the question, Mike. It, it's, um good questions. Uh, first, regarding the processes, uh, the way the <coughs> AMAP assessments are done is um, they contribute, um, each Arctic states can nominate their, their um, experts to, to, to the assessment. So, so what we do see is, is all, of the, all the Arctic states are nominating experts to, to the, the AMAP assessment reports. Um, some of them are founded uh, by the states themselves uh, through in kind. So, so for instance, for Norwegian Polar Institute, they do have in their um, 
in, in their uh, description of the mission to, to support AMAP with their work. So, so those are founded uh, internally through their, um, through their, through their uh, internal funding. <clears throat> in, in some cases, um, we do have uh, external uh, funding uh, either, I mean, for like, for instance, for, for Canada, Canada uh, fund AMAP, Secretariat, and, and we, we do uh, pay for their experts. So it's kind of, it's, it's kind of in kind, it's just taking an extra loop on it, to it. Um, and we also have, but we also have uh, experts from, from observer countries and, and uh, organizations. So, so they usually fund themselves. Um, we do have um, contributions for, from both Arctic states and others on, on, uh, for, for production and for um, workshops and so on. So, so um, it's, I would say 70, 80% of the funding is through, is through the Arctic states themselves and then the rest comes through observers or through um, external, external funding. Um, to say a bit about the process, um, we, do, we are similar to the IPCC in, in, in some ways. Uh, what I didn't say about the reports, um, the reports are, the, they are written by, by the experts and I, as you see now, Jim, uh, Jim we present here, and he's one of those uh, that have been 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 written some uh, written some writing some of these reports. Um, they are <clears throat> they go through peer review. So even though they re they mainly refer to to peer reviewed literature um, in the assessment, the, the the report itself goes through an independent peer review process, just as any other scientific journal. Um, and and. Uh, uh, and, and that peer review is, is managed by the, by the Secretariat. Um, so, so we are kind of similar to the, to the IPCC, but um, the, the, the assessment reports themselves, they are, I would say they are, much, they are based upon the experts' views and not the Arctic Council as such. And that's also why you see the disclaimer at the, at the uh, back cover of the report saying this, uh, this report rep represent the views of the experts and not, not the other council as such. Um, <clears throat> regarding climate intervention, um, we have been discussing it and we have been contacted by, by people working with climate interventions. Um, at the moment, we haven't really been um, doing any assessment of, on that, even though we've been given some feedback on, 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 on uh, reports from, from others. Um, you could say that in, in one way, what I presented on the last slide, the, the uh, adaption management, it could act as a kind of a climate intervention um, when it comes to, to feedbacks from climate to, to sorry, from feedbacks from uh, ecosystems to climate. Um, but uh, we haven't really been, been working in detail with that. Um, I guess we might, See that happening in the future, taking the the the, the climate change uh, predictions into into consideration. I mean, there are, there are both the physical science aspects, and then there's also been emerging discussion about social science aspects, mm -hmm. and yeah. whether how it might or might not fit in with indigenous peoples' viewpoints about things and relationships to nature. So I guess it's a very broad question that would need mm. a lot of consideration. Mm. Yeah, it is, and we do uh, we do also, in addition to, to the assessments, we do uh, smaller projects in a way. So one of the things we're doing right now is something called the CITE project, which is actually um, uh, coordinated by Sami Reinderhörders, where they they see they see how climate change impacts uh, their livelihood, and and so they are kind of designing the project on how to how to gain information that is actually adaptable for for them to into their into their everyday uh, work in a way. So 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 as you say, like it's um, the relation to I, I guess social science will be a more will be an important part also in the future. I mean, we did have the same in the AACA reports and the and the see report partly so so i guess we'll see that come back into to a larger extent in in the future 
uh, and we do in the in the coming period we, we do plan to to also do to have an assessment on on or a report on on societal impacts in a kind of a extension of, of the chapter we saw in the last you know, or in this current report thank you i think i've seen two persons want to have the floor before we go to jenny uh, paul did you show a hand for um to take the floor no okay and it is susan hancock the floor is yours yes thank you thank you very much all for your presentation today really enjoyed it i just have one question when you spoke a little bit about the ministerial and revenue where climate wasn't mentioned where it was in Reykjavik. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the current chair of the of AMAP is the United States at the moment, unless that just swap. I'm just wondering whether the chairmanship, assuming it rotates, whether that changes agenda and how that fits in with the long-term planning ongoing work of AMAP. Thank you, Susanna, for the question. Um, yeah, it's, it's right, the, the current chair of AMAP is Ben D'Angelo from NOAA. Uh, so so US, we have a US chair this, uh, in the, the common, or in this period. Um, the, although we do deliver uh, in the same kind of uh, chairmanship rotation cycle as the rest of the Arctic Ministerial meeting, our plan, planning takes much longer, it's much longer a process. So, so we work on six year, work plans or maybe even eight year work plans. So, so what we, um, some of the, the decisions on, on assessments have been taken a long time ago. Um, they are of course adjusted uh, throughout the process. Um, I would say, uh, even though we could expect to see some change in, in directions uh, due to the chair, the, the um, level of strategic decisions in, in AMAP is the, the what we call the HOTS meeting or head of delegates meeting where all the head of delegates are present and are made in consensus. So, so it's a very robust when it comes to um, uh, national priorities or, or changing national priorities. Uh, I would also say that we haven't, we haven't seen that in, in, in AMAP because, uh, and I guess that's a result of um, the head of delegates being, uh, they're, they're not uh, part of political organizations or, or, or the political level, but they're, they're usually um, at the management level, so so Ben, for instance, is from NOAA. We usually have them on the. They're usually people from the uh, the uh, environmental directorates or or, or um, ministries, but usually the bureaucrat uh, bureaucracy, not the not the political part of the ministries. So so we see. I have I, I feel that we are very resilient when it comes to to. If you can say political perturbations in this, this case, um, and we saw the same during the during the last period uh, when the, as I said, the, the political situation was a bit stressed due, of course, due to the um, U.S. presidency, um, but it didn't affect AMAP at all, and and uh, um, we just uh, we were aware that we shouldn't. Uh, it was good, good not to bring any issues up on the political level, of course, uh, but except for that, it was it didn't change any directions of, of the work we do. Thank you. Thank you. I think we turn over to Jenny. Okay, I see James has oh. a hand, but I think we, if we give a floor to Jenny now and um, take questions afterwards, and I think the time is running. So um, Jenny has the floor now for the next 15 minutes, and then we take questions to her, and then we come back to AMAP questions. There are several more, I guess, that will come up to the Arctic Council. So Jenny, please. Sorry. Um, thanks, Lars Otto, and thanks everybody for the opportunity to talk to you today about the third Arctic Science Ministerial. Um, it was originally supposed to be held in uh, November of last year, but because of COVID, it was postponed till May. Um, I'm just going to kind of go through the process of the ASM here briefly and then point out some of the things from the um, joint statement as well as the, the products that were produced that I think might be of particular interest to the B2BI uh, crowd. So this was the third Arctic Science Ministerial. Uh, the first was held in 2016. In, um, 
the US and the second was held in 2018 by the EU, Finland and Germany. Uh, Karin who's here was the chair of the science committee for that. Um, and she was also the representative from the ASM2 um, to the ASM3. Uh, so the, in total, there were 27 countries that participated in, in this third meeting. Um, in addition to that, there was also the um, permanent participants of the Arctic Council, as well as a number of international science and education organizations with an interest in the Arctic. Um, so this was, uh, it, it's uh, slightly different from the Arctic Council in that it's open to any country that has an interest in Arctic research. Um, so quite a few of the, or all of the Arctic countries, of course, were participants, a number of the observers, and then some other new countries that have interests like um, Thailand and Malaysia. Um, so it was, it's nice, it's a different platform because it's open to um, all countries interested in, in research in the Arctic and how that impacts the, the planet. I was just going to say next slide, please, but that's me. So, <laughs> um, so the three, the, the four themes of the uh, Arctic Science Ministerial were observe, understand, respond, and strengthen. And um, these are meant to be thought of in an iterative cycle. So you first have to observe what's happening to understand it, and then you can deal how to respond it, and then figure out how to strengthen um, the different systems so that we can adapt. Uh, Majority of the science work was done by the Science Advisory Board. It included representatives from the two host countries, which is Iceland and, um, and Japan. It also included representatives from a number of the international Arctic science organizations, including the Arctic Observing Summit, um, the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists, representatives from the first ministerial Arctic Science Ministerial, as well as representative from the second Arctic Science Ministerial, the representative from the International Arctic Science Committee, or IASC, as well as the International Association for Arctic so Social Sciences Association, IASA. Um, and also important to the Science Steering Committee was the participation of the Indigenous uh, community. Uh, we had an Indigenous Arctic Knowledge Holder representative and an Indigenous Science representative. We also had, of course, someone from SAN. A sustained Arctic Observing Network and the University of the Arctic. So those folks um, were on the science advisory board in their own right as scientists and, and knowledge holders, as well as representing their organizations. And then of course there were the ex officio folks behind the scenes. Um, we asked each country and organization to submit a number of different things. Um, Arctic research overviews, which are nice two page glimpses into what countries and organizations are doing as far as Arctic research any updates on projects that they submitted to the second um, Arctic Science Ministerial, as well as new projects. And also new this year was, um, uh, we sent out a information or a survey collecting information from countries on where they thought more collaboration was needed, um, what opportunities they have for cooperation in the Arctic. Um, so that was all synthesized together with a number of um, science community workshops and conferences that were held to kind of pull together as much information and be as open and transparent in the process as, as possible. And all this information can be, can be found online. Uh, so just a brief summary, in total, there were 434 projects that were submitted. So countries and organizations could choose what they wanted to submit. Um, we suggested that they make sure that they have a large international component because that's what this meeting was all about, was strengthening international science cooperation. Um, of this, um, 257 were new projects. So there's an increase in the amount of projects that are being submitted to the Arctic Science Ministerial, um, which could show an increase or in the interest in what the outcomes could be. In the report, there's a little bit of statistics, um, just a couple highlights that I think are very interesting. Um, Norway was mentioned as a collaborating country in over half the projects that were submitted. So this could partially be because Svalbard is so important, but um, I think Norway has a, a very strong um, international research component. And those of us who've had the privilege of, of working with Norwegians and in Norway uh, know that I have to give a plug to my my former country. Um, uh, US, Canada, and Russia, of course, and a lot of collaborations. Um, and and um, a number of the smaller countries, too, are, are important in Arctic research. So there's more information on that in the report. Um, theme two, so understanding, was um, of interest most for the projects submitted. 
and um, disappointingly to me, uh, respond was less so. Um, so there were more projects looking at what, how we can understand what's happening in the Arctic and not as many on how we respond to that. So maybe in the future we can try and um, encourage countries and, and international science projects to, to work more on the responding apps aspect of how we deal with climate change. And we heard about a number of the things that are happening from, from Rolf. So hopefully we can respond a little bit better. So just some of the highlights of the final outcomes. There is the final report, which is online. It has the science summary, which was a distillation of those 434 projects into 30 pages. Um, so it's, a, it's not a whole lot of meat, but it gives a nice summary. Um, there are the Arctic research overviews. So if you ever wanna know what a country is doing, who their funders of Arctic research are, what their priorities are, those two page overviews are a nice quick glance at what's going on. Um, we also had a new section um, to the report called Moving Forward. We originally had titled this Recommended Actions, uh, but some countries uh, didn't exactly like the fact that we would be including a, an actions section. Um, so we had to change the, the title of it a little bit. And so that section is basically meant to be um, next steps that the science committee recommends that um, people take or scientists take, countries who are making funding decisions take to help address some of the changes. The, Joint Statement of Ministers is also in there um, as a product of this, as well as a number of online resources, and I'll mention those um, in, a, in a little bit. So the Joint Statement, which is always, you know, the, the highlight, I guess, um, where the countries come together and agree that these are the things that they think are important for Arctic science. I'm just going to point to a couple of things that I think are relevant to our work here with um, the B2BI. So the, the statement, um, and I, and I think the statement, the main parts of the negotiations, I should uh, preface this, were done um, when the Biden administration came into office. So uh, that might have something to do with the, the things that were agreed upon. Um, all the countries agree that a number of the assessments that have been put out are very important and that a number of things that are coming up, um, they all want to support the implementation of, and that includes the, the 2030 agenda for sustainable development, the Paris Agreement, um, Global Biodiversity Framework, as well as a, a number of the reports and activities of the Arctic Council working groups. They also supported the implementation of the Agreement on Enhancing Scientific Cooperation in the Arctic. Um, this has kind of been a bit of a slow process, but um, now uh, Russia is the chair of that project as well as the chair of the Arctic Council. So hopefully we will make some steps in, in actually implementing what that agreement agreed to do. Um, they also suggested um, that they support the processes to ratify um, the agreement to prevent unre unregulated high seas fisheries in the Central Ocean, which I thought was um, a step forward. Um, dealing with each section of or each theme of the Arctic Council, or, sorry, of the um, ASM3 for observe, they acknowledged again the lack of data and the importance of sustained observations what that means uh, realistically and how countries are going to do that, we will see. But they did uh, strongly support the uh, Say on Roads process, as well as a number of things that were submitted from the Arctic Observing Summit in their call to action, which is included in the, in the report as well. Um, the efforts of the Arctic Data Committee were, were um, pointed out as something to support, as well as the development of new technologies, particularly remote sensing or um, on remotely operated uh, vehicles and, and new technologies to help us understand and increase our observations in the Arctic. For the theme of understand, um, they stressed that the uh, research on, into the changing patterns of, of things in the Arctic is important, as well as the underlying mechanisms to why things are changing. So research projects in that area will be encouraged. Um, they also encouraged the, um, the assessment process. So things like like Rolf talked about as AMAP we're doing and perhaps even some of the things that we've talked about in B2BI about doing an assessment on, on the North Atlantic um, Arctic region. They also stressed the importance of promoting multinational initiatives um, such as Mosaic and YAP. Um, so, and these were both uh, bottom up um, science efforts. So ho hopefully that means they'll continue to support things like that. Um, encouraging research efforts and the co-production of knowledge which is kind of a phrase that we've been We've been talking about too with our work with B2BI. Um, prediction of mitigation and risks and hazards, as well as pollution, infectious diseases, food security, 
fisheries, biodiversity, and impacts on human health and well being. Again, all these things that we've talked about in, in B2BI as are also important from the joint statement um, from the ASM3. And then to, provide, to prioritize projects that looked at the linkages between these things, as well as the sociological and, and ecological systems interacting and humors, humans as drivers of change. So you might be seeing uh, similar things to what we've been talking about in our efforts here. So the understanding realm is, is uh, I think we're right on track with the, with the joint statement in our work. In the respond theme, um, and again, this was an area that I think needs to be strengthened and was pretty clear in the joint statement that they agreed on that as well. They wanted to see ambitious actions. Uh, what's meant by that, we'll, we'll see. Um, they wanna support scientific inter international groups working on, on these aspects. So that's again, us. Um, prioritize research that looked at both the social and ecological systems interacting together, um, as well as fostering research to support mitigation and adaptation to climate change, uh, preparedness and response, plans for search and rescue, pollution remediation, wildfires, which may not be so much in our realm, um, but definitely there's lots of socially relevant things that we're talking about, um, and that comes through here. So this is the right the basis of what we've been talking about for B2BI is to, you know, what is the science that needs to go into these various things? So I think we're, we're on the right track, but we just need to get our plans into action. And finally, the fourth um, theme for the ASM3 was strengthen. And here um, it was very much, in the, the whole Arctic Science Ministerial as a whole was very much about encouraging and, and making meaningful participation um, with ind indigenous peoples um, and their, their self-determination to, to you know, help fix the problems that they're having to understand the environment and to work with scientists in a, in a more meaningful way. Um, and to make sure that the results that we find from the different science projects that we're looking at are, are being sent back and utilized by residents, businesses, and decision makers. Again, similar uh, things to what we've been talking about. Um, one interesting thing they did agree to was to decrease bureaucratic barriers. Um, I would like to see that. I don't know how they're going to do that, but hopefully the Arctic Science Agreement will help with that. There were a number of other cross-cutting um, areas in the joint statement that were talked about, and that's um, increasing high-speed communication. So making sure people in the Arctic have um, high-speed internet, which I think would be a, a big step forward and change um, a lot of the, the ways that society is interacting. Um, to have ethically open data policy. Um, I think we've been talking about that for a long time. Uh, let's see if that changes. And also the support of the Arctic Funders Forum, which is a new thing that came out of um, the second Arctic Science Ministerial, bringing together countries to start talking about how they can collaborate on, you know, different priorities for funding, as well as actually sharing um, the funding of different international projects. So those are just a number of things um, from the statement itself. You can look at that in more detail um, on your own. Um, the, the chapter on moving forward um, also talks about a number of these um, particular steps and was meant to kind of give a guide to the different points that the joint statement uh, pointed out as to like some smaller steps that can be taken to support some of those overarching goals. Um, so you can you can look at what's in that um, as well. It talks a lot about the same things we've all been talking about. Um, but the, the new thing here again, I think this for the third Arctic Science Ministerial is that um, indigenous capacity building and involvement was very much highlighted including specifically asking for funding for indigenous peoples to be involved in, in international research. So I, I see a lot of progress, particularly involving and engaging with, with indigenous folks. Let's, let's hope that comes into reality. So some of the um, resources that are available, um, the main one, and this is something that I dreamt up um, uh, with Volker and Karin when we were working on the Arctic Science Ministerial 2, we got all this information in from all these countries on all the projects that are going on and, and they just sort of sat in an Excel file on my computer and weren't shared with other scientists. And we thought this could be a really cool tool that other scientists could use to find who's doing what where, um, as well as policymakers. So I'm just going to um, stop the presentation here for a minute and take you to the database itself to show you how interesting or how easy it is. Um, so there's several different ways you can search either by list or by map. Um, I'm going to choose the list search. 
we have a number of filters here on the left. Um, so if it was a new project updated, which countries um, might have submitted it or organizations, um, the themes, the goals, um, collaborating countries. Um, and just to show you here, we also have an option for location on the North Atlantic Ocean. So you can search to find the 21 projects that were submitted to the Arctic for the third Arctic Science Ministerial that deal with the North Atlantic Ocean region. So this could become a, an important uh, tool for us in finding potential um, projects and, and countries that are interested in the North Atlantic region to collaborate with. So I encourage you all to take a, take a quick look at that resource. Um, there's a lot of information to find and, and encourage your colleagues to look through there too. Um, we're, we're hoping it will be updated in time as well and be a nice resource for what's happening in the Arctic where. A number of also uh, additional Arctic Science Ministerial resources that will be put online. Um, I mentioned the, the International Collaboration Survey. So out of that is going to come three different um, types of resources. One, uh, countries were asked what types of funding mechanisms they have to support international scientists. So here we will have a list of all the different things that Austria, for example, offers on how international scientists can be funded to do work with their researchers. So that's for all the countries participating in, in the Arctic Science Ministerial. So I think that will also be a great resource um, when looking for, for funds on, and who we can help to, or who we can find to help us support our B2BI efforts. There's a number of um, opportunities for indigenous people that were also contributed to that. So there's a resource on that. And then I, I, I don't think I've ever seen this before, but this will be a nice reference of all the country's um, Arctic policies, their science policies, whether that's you know from, from their science agency or their foreign policy agency, anything that has to do with what their priorities are and their goals are for Arctic research. And so all of those from the different countries will be listed in one place as well, which I think will be a good resource moving forward. Um, the other part that we were able to do, thanks to the delay in the uh, actual hosting of the ministerial, was we worked with the European Polar Board and had a uh, webinar series. And all of that information can be found um, on the European Polar Board's YouTube site. So if you're looking for something to binge watch this weekend, I encourage you to take, take a look at those, um, those webinars. They break down each individual theme. Um, there's a nice overview of what was submitted to the theme, as well as uh, we highlighted five projects that were submitted to each of the different themes. And um, so I encourage you to, to check those out. Uh, the, the wonderful thing is that the Arctic Science Ministerial will continue. Um, the next one will be hosted by Russia and France. Um, we don't have a whole lot of details on that, but on the last um, webinar of the series, couple of weeks, last week, I guess it was, Anton Vasiliev um, talked about uh, their just that their hopes for the ministerial and, and what will be coming. So I think if you're looking to find out more, um, Anton would be the, the guy to contact at this point. So the Arctic Science Ministerial website will be updated um, as more of a document resource instead of a working website. So look forward to that if you want to know more information. And um, with that, I am done with my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Karen is also here, so Karen, if you have, have anything in addition to say, um, please feel free. Thank you, Jenny. Very interesting and good presentation. Been running this assessment that you heard Rolf made for 30 years. I have faced three hurdles to get the data into AMAP, and the one was the countries. I can mention US and Russia as the two primarily who were reluctant to provide data specifically related to some topics they find of interest either for their country or for some of their businesses. The other was the openness to access geographical areas, also reluctance to give because of, of course, military interest, but also some other interest, economy, businesses. And the third problem, we, the, the, the second problem we faced was that many of the institutes had data they wouldn't share unless they get something back again. Their institute silver. And I met that two years ago at this Putin meeting in St. Petersburg, the same was still there. We have a lot of data and we're willing to share if we get something. And the third hurdles is the education system that young scientists were not willing to share the data 
because they wanted to take the first publication to themselves to get the credit for their academic career. And I didn't hear you mention any of these during the discussion. So the ministers didn't go into the hurdles. They were very much very nice things, but these three hurdles I didn't hear you touched upon. So uh, they're a little bit. Um, I don't think they were touched upon uh, how we would like them to be, but there was a, one of the particular webinars that we had was to address the gaps and barriers in international research collaboration. And uh, Peter Pulsifer was one of the leaders of the uh, data breakout. And they came up with some specific recommendations that need to happen to be addressed. And that you can find in the gaps and barriers report, as well as in, in some of the steps moving forward in that document. Um, so the scientists and the, the, uh, the science committee came forward with recommendations that needed to be done. Um, I don't think that was picked up in the level of the joint um, statement as perhaps it could be. Um, and we'll see what happens with the next one. But uh, one, one thing that I can kick myself for, and there's many, but when I was designing these forms to fill out for projects, I forgot to include a data question. And that was a missed opportunity because we could have asked actually for where the data is and what the status is of the data for each of those projects. And, and I, I, I missed the vote on that one, which I, yeah. Um, but hopefully if they use the same process for next time, um, we can ask where the data is and we can start to gather um, what's going on. There also was, you know, some points of, we need to have an Arctic data assessment, like where are, where is all the Arctic data? And I know that the, the IASC and SEAN's Arctic data committee is trying to work on all that, but we need funding to support those people for doing it. Cause a lot of those folks are, are volunteers too. So maybe, you know, some of these organizations can, can pick up that line of thought and, and fund some folks to actually dig into where that data is. All right. Karin, do you want to say something? Just to add to Jenny, yes, we discussed it, especially the, also the problem of getting access to areas uh, and how to make it easier to, to do work in different countries, uh, exclusive economic zones. Uh, and there are quite a number of new initiatives for data centers uh, in China, in Japan, in various places, for various types of data. And these are always promising to be open and accessible. So it's not so much going to institutions, but having these hubs for data somewhere. I'm not sure how this will continue. And Seon has a big job to do, actually, mm -hmm. to actually pull it together. Thank you. I don't see any hand. Jim, do you want to take your questions you had? Uh, just a quick note on, on Susanna's uh, question. NOAA and the US is back. Climate is actually the number one goal for NOAA and I personally appreciate the working through AMAP for, for as an outlet for me for the last four years. Thank you. Mike, I saw your hand. Well, I guess I'm interested in how the how this entered this effort, Jenny got got started and whether it might be a model for what you'd like B2B or what, you know, Bob and other, uh, all of us think B2B might have for the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, should there be a similar sort of entity or effort for the Atlantic uh, community, Atlantic Ocean community? All right. Anyone, Bob, you want to give a crack on that? You have to unmute yourself, Bob. Uh, Jim, tell them all who's the new head of NOAA. Uh, Rick Spinrag was uh, uh, sworn in uh, yesterday. So he's a strong advocate. And uh, I sent him a little note on don't forget the Arctic. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, no, he won't. 
No, that's a, I think for those of us who had the opportunity to work with Noah, he brings a, a host of experience. He was in fact, head of the research arm at NOAA for a while. He'd been in many, many powerful positions, but as Jim says, uh, he, uh, the climate issue was uh, very much a part of his daily life. So it's a good addition for all of us here uh, in the US. Um, you wanted me to pick up on Mike's question. Uh, Mike, give it to me again so my brain can focus. Well, it, it's whether um, this whole effort that Jenny described is what one might want to have for the Atlantic and B2B to be instead. Would you, I mean, having this kind of list of projects, uh, encouragement of cooperative research and all sorts of, of other things, would that be something that one should be thinking that there's an Atlantic science ministerial group or whatever it would be called, unfortunately, the same initials. But, but uh, I mean, it, it's, oh. it, it seems what got accomplished by the Arctic group seems very productive. I, Mike, I agree that uh, the trend from the first, second and third, now third, uh, proves that there are 27 nations, which means uh, if we went through it, there are a number of nations that are not even observers in the Arctic Council, because uh, I think uh, if you try it, you only get up to about 20. So there are quite a few are not, which is good. It's a good development. With respect to the B2B aspect, uh, we have been assembling who, who might be the key players in each of these over 20 nations in the B2B region. And we have not gone that next step, but there's no doubt in my mind that some of the things you just described would be to open that. And in fact, Mike, to use your 10 bullets in your important issues as the glue for them all to ask this, is this, are these exactly the kind of things? So not exactly the same, but very similar in concept, but we haven't gone that far yet, but we have been gathering, thanks to Paul and Lars Otto, uh, the, the key players we think in each of these nations. We don't use the ministerial connection. We try to get to who are some of the major players and they actually may be in the private sector. Uh, more so, but that's something we're working on. I'm glad you raised the question because it's spot on. And just from a you know another act aspect, B2BI as a entity, right? We could try and collect projects that are of interest in the region and create our database and things like that. But um, the problem is that, that stuff takes a lot of resources to create and maintain, and we're still um, you know all volunteers here. So, right. uh, you know, we're, we, there's lots of things that we can do, but we can't until we, you know, get the next step and start uh, putting in some funding proposals. But those are definitely things I think we should do. Yeah, thank you. Karin. This is a very interesting idea of Mike. Um, and if you look at the Arctic Science Ministerial, it started because the Arctic became geopolitically very important. And it came out of, well, out of a time or out of a, a area where <clears throat> it wasn't important. And suddenly you had to actually find something where um, the science could sort of develop. You had the Arctic Council, but they, they had working groups, but they were not necessarily including all the nations who are doing research in the Arctic. So it was a bit of an empty playing field or not totally empty, but you, know, you had the space to develop. And before we think about that for the North Atlantic, we have to find firstly, uh, what are the geopolitically important issues? And I think, yes, we have quite a number of good points there. We have to have a um, someone to take the lead like Obama did uh, for the Arctic. It would not have happened if he would not have said, I want this to happen. And uh, thirdly, we have to make sure that all the other uh, different groups and associations and uh, agreements which are already there, um, that 
that this fits together and that there is not a, a kind of struggle for competition. Mm. Mm. So it is more of a difficult area to actually develop something like this. It's not impossible, it's possible, um, but we have to find the right uh, level and the right tone for this. So, so one of the things I, I learned very strangely decades ago was that NATO actually has not just a, a security and a political kind of link, but it has a third aspect that is educational. Um, and, and, and that's a, an interesting framing, although it leaves out some, it, it sort of by implication leaves out some members who would, would want to be on it. Although I must say, I, I learned a lot about it when we actually had a meeting in Sicily organized by NATO and we invited a whole bunch, a number of Russian scientists because it was about nuclear winter. And they were absolutely amazed that they could be funded and participated in a NATO activity. That was something that, that uh, was just personally interesting to them to, to be coming and, and saying, oh, here, here was Russia cooperating, well, the Soviet Union at the time, cooperating with NATO on doing educational scientific kinds of things. So it may be there are some entities around that might be a mechanism for building that or so, uh, Lars Otto. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm going to uh, share some things that we've not put in B2B documents before, and I realized that was a shortcoming. Uh, and I'd like to just tell you uh, some things that happened, and it will be this will be in some of our upcoming documents, like the the premise document. But. Uh, most everybody on this meeting knows about the special report of IPCC on the ocean and the cryosphere. And um, there's a mechanism by which uh, both AMAP and uh, the, uh, the threads that are a part of the assessment, we were confronted by a number of people. I got telephone calls from uh, several um, of the major players in IPCC AR6, and uh, I think uh, uh, others as well. And they raised the following question. Is there a region on the planet where the evidence of climate, environmental, social economic change is scientifically evident and compelling? And that forced us to really think things through. And out of that came the conclusion that the North Atlantic internet inter inexorably connected to the Arctic is, is one of those regions and maybe one of the mo more cogent regions. And that has then evolved into what we now B2, call B2B. So there is a, and there is a mechanism that we need to go back to and explore as Lars Otto knows very well, there is a signed agreement between those of us working in the high, high North and IPCC that was signed uh, during Bob Watson's chairman of IPCC, but is still there and was in fact a background that led to a lot of the participation of some of you on this call in that special report on the ocean and the cryosphere. So uh, there's some glue there that actually begins to feed back into Mike McCracken's question and comment. And it opened a door for my thinking that while we've been looking at these eight, uh, 20 plus countries, we maybe really ought to be looking at how they support research. And that would be like the Norwegian Research Council and uh, things like that in the US. Um, it opened a new door of thinking, Mike, that we had been more, maybe too general need to be more specific uh, because those are the entities by which research gets supported and, and I appreciate the comment made that education has to be an organic part of that. But that's a little background that might lead us to do some new thinking, Mike, out of your comment. Thank you. Thank you. This is a good discussion, but I see that time is running too, but uh, any more questions or comments? Katrin, I have, a, I have a hand below your face. I don't know if, it's, if you have asked for the... <laughs> Uh, not me. Jack has his hand up. Oh, okay. 
Jack? Yeah, I was just wanting to comment on, on you know, Mike's idea or suggestion to consider trying to build a, an Atlantic or North Atlantic ministerial kind of edifice. And, and I don't know, I mean, I, I think that I, I appreciate Bob's responses that you want to maybe keep it at a lower level. I mean, I would hope that, uh, well, I know we just heard Jenny say that the, the bureaucracy in the Arctic science ministerial, when you get that high in all these governments, is pretty uh, overwhelming. And the fact that uh, how long ago did they agree to the science cooperation and the fishing moratorium and, and nothing real has come of it, you know, three or four years later. I mean, Lars Otto talked about the hurdles for data that have been plaguing the community for decades and they're still out there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that Bob's idea to find out the people that are actual players rather than their high level bosses is a better way to go, but maybe everybody else wants to be at a really high level. I guess I, think... I might just say though, that what's impressive about the Arctic Science Ministerial and the, the data that Jenny has gotten is that countries actually responded to all those kinds of things. I mean, we had a terrible time with the USGCRP trying to get agencies to list all their activities and stuff. We, we worked really hard at it. And, and I, I, I guess I'm wondering if having the authority of calling it a ministerial level activity actually gets countries committed to responding to describing what their projects are and the other things that Jenny got into such a wonderful database. So I understand there's bureaucratic responsibility problems and complications if you go up, but, but you also get sometimes um, a better response, I think, if you get a high level authority sort of saying to everybody they have to do it or they need to do it. <laughs> Just a question. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, IARPIC is doing a very good job of getting all the U.S. agencies to play together nicely right. and enlist that kind of stuff. And it's, I'm sure it's happening in other parts of the world. But my point is that, you know, I mean, when, when was the science cooperation agreement actually inserted into the Arctic Science Ministerial? Was that at the first one? And it still doesn't have any teeth? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't go to Russia and get the data that everyone wants, and you can't even no. sail over the dateline without being threatened with nuclear annihilation, right? So, I mean, <laughs> where are we going? No, I agree with you. That, that's the okay. frustration that uh, there's no breakthrough into this hurdle to open up this one. And when I was chairing this session in, in, in St. Petersburg two years ago, the, the it was absolutely a blocking. All of these directors of their institutes, they had fantastic data. And I said, why don't you share them? We have called for them for decades. No, no, no. They were not interested. And I said, well, how on earth can we change their mood? Of course, it's linked to politics and to funding and other aspects here. So I'm well, told I, that I, the science minister should start talking about this at their level. How can we open up the system here? So maybe we can push that on, on Russia and France, but that's maybe not the best two countries to <laughs> expect that anything happens. So, I, I was also yeah. on SCORE for many years, and so I was the atmospheric representative to SCORE. And the, and the general feeling was that there was much better sharing of atmospheric data than there is of oceanic data. Yeah. That, that that's just generally, uh, I don't know why, why it happens to be, but it, it turned out to, to very much be the case so but the well, atmosphere people have that's... learned in doing these inner comparisons that it's of great value to share da data and everybody putting their models together and, and doing these comparisons i'm not sure that's come yet to the to the uh, ocean community a fast answer to you when we made AMAP, we saw the, the group that was easiest to work with were the atmospheric people because the wind is blowing over their countries and they're interested to know what's coming from neighbors. <laughs> the second easiest group was the marine people, oceanographer, because the same happened with the ocean. The most problematic group was the terrestrial because they were looking on fixed animals or trees in their territories. Bob. Yeah, I, this is. I want to compliment both Ralph and Jenny, 
because you have put the kind of discussion that I think we all must have, not only in the B2B community, but even elsewhere uh, as well. We have, we, there are log jams in terms of getting the collaboration we glibly talk about, but the machinery underneath it is really got two dimensions. And Lars Otto's brought up one and that's OBS and data and you know basic information. I'll tell you a little side story way back when, when we created this thing called IGFA, that when we wanted to do that, and we put a, a um, data agreement on the table and ask everybody to sign it, and they, they, were author they had the authority to sign for their nation, the Brits came up, can't sign it, can't sign it. And I said, why can't? 40% of our budget comes from selling data, and we're not about to play in that game. And, and when you dig into it, you got that selling the data and then the other that Larsado talked about. And I think uh, if I can say to you all, I hope this kind of discussion, maybe we can have some offline discussions over the coming months when we slow down our normal stuff and pick up this. The other dimension that really bothers me immensely is we have beautiful stuff, you just saw it but hardly anybody who really needs it, it, it gets thrown in their face in some fashion. And um, there are some efforts to try to fix that, but we're, the, the difficulty of getting this information to flow out in, a, in some way where it reaches the people who both are already on board and those who aren't, so that other kind of dialogues can take place because I think we all would agree we're still in a log jam and trying to deal with the, uh, the climate issue. Um, everybody talks about the Paris Agreement and give a lot of lip service to it, but we're, we're certainly not on track there. And part of it is beautiful information that we have here is not getting out. So we may need to deal with this outreach and communication issue for, uh, for us. In, and Jenny's going to look at me. She said, Corral, I got enough on my plate. <laughs> but it's, it, it's a downstream thing that we're going to have to think about. Thank you. I have two hands. It's Kai and then Rolf. So um, I'll give you a floor to Kai first. All right, thank you. And yeah, so just a quick comment on the, uh, sort of the difference in the, in the attitudes towards sharing in the atmospheric and the oceanic, uh, oceanographic community. I think. Early on, uh, through WMO and, and the standardization of data, it's become very easy to share atmospheric data. And also, the data has got immediate value in near real time because they were ingested into the uh, um, uh, sort of analysis systems for, uh, for the weather services. And I think we need to push in the same way to also show that the near real time data streams of oceanographic data also has a real value when it comes to the sort of ocean forecasting and and the preparedness with regards to search and rescue, mm -hmm. uh, oil spill mitigation, shipping, and, and that kind of thing. So I think if we can convincingly show that the sharing of the data, uh, there's also a significant societal impact with regards to improved services, then that is an additional argument. It's not just supporting the science and playing sort of far away in the future, but it's it's something which is an immediate need. Uh, but I still think that the ease of access and uh, agreeing on proper use of metadata and distributed data hubs and, and, and proper formats is really essential to, uh, to make this work. Thank you. Very good. And Rolf? Thank you, Lashoto. And I guess this is a follow-up of what Kai, Kai just said. Uh, two, two mine and one thought, I guess you could say. Uh, but Lashoto, you mentioned those three obstacles for, for, for data um, provisioning. Um, I guess there's also now we, we see a fourth one coming as is the immense amount of data that we will actually see in the future due to due to autonomous data sampling, due to the, the I mean, just seeing what the Mosaic crews and what the Nelson legacy does, it's, it's just a waste amount, it's just a vast amount of data. Um, and even though the data has, even though if you have open access to the data, you still have uh, 
unlimited access to data as long as you don't know it. And, and Kai, you touched upon it, mentioned in the metadata. Um, looking on Europe and, and the EU uh, framework programs, there's often, there's often a demand of, of having open access data. Um, however, when you look on the Arctic, and, and uh, of course, when you have it within the European Union, you can always harmonize the data and, and or harmonize the metadata. But when you look upon the Arctic, it is only you do not have an organization like the European Union or something. There's no there's no large uh, organization with the financial power to kind of force this kind of harmonization or alignment of of, of metadata. Um, and and I guess my question both goes to 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 Jenny and and also plays up to to, to Michael Kershaw here. Uh, how do we see this actually been implemented? I mean, we can always talk about this, but how, how can this actually be implemented in the Arctic? Uh, was that discussed during Arctic Science Ministerial? And, and, and maybe Michael, you can also say something about the Arctic passion and, 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 and how such projects can maybe can, can facilitate this process. I, I thought Jim has asked for the floor, but um, Mike, uh, Mike, you want to answer the question before I give the floor to Jim? Well, I can't can't say any details uh, right now. Or if, if if I was the one who, who was uh, targeted by, by Rolf, I, I wasn't quite sure because there was some noise in the background right now. Um, but yes, we, we have one work package which is dealing uh, with interoperability of data and better data harmonization. And that is led by um, Oystein Godoy from Matt Norway um, and, and Janine Felden, who is leading the Pan Pangea um, framework. At our, we really hope that um, our actions can forward this uh, a little bit, but we can. Um, inform you on some details on that uh, later on in the in the process once we have settled a little bit. So um, I can't tell you by heart right now what exactly are the are the plans we are going to do. Thank you. I think that we're running uh, one and a half hours soon. So I think I give the the last floor to Jim. Okay. I'll go in a, in a slightly different direction. Something to think about over the summer and that's uh, a new idea out there that's decision making under uncertainty as rolf showed there there are a lot of new extreme uh events out there some we've never seen before and they vary in type and location timing and duration and you you can't almost by definition you can't extrapolate uh previous data forward uh and so uh in the community and it and it's even mentioned in in uh, the uh, ocean cryosphere or ipcc report uh, that one should think in terms of uh, scenarios and uh, storytelling and then back figure what uh, the implications are on that rather using models to extrapolate uh, forward and this seem <clears throat> this seems like something uh, to consider on on uh, how you would make the science uh, social link uh, in B2B. Thank you. This has been a very interesting one and a half hour, and I think we could have gone on for another one and a half. But I think that uh, some of us have some other issues to do now, since it's the midsummer, midsummer celebration here in Europe. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to thank you all of you for a, a fantastic, a great uh, meeting of this today. And uh, we will have a summing up next um, Wednesday. Then those who want to join, they can join. We try to sum up what have don't be a made during this uh, half year since Christmas. So.
So um, by that, I thank you all of you for, uh, and have a nice summer before we gather again in the autumn. Thank you. Bye-bye.